Living and Designing with Water. Water is a primary condition for life. A human consists for approximately 60% of water. We need about 2 liters of fresh water every day. This water transports nutrients and waste in and out of our bodies. But we use a lot more than that. On average, a Western European person uses about 130 liters of water a day. Only 4% of this water is used for food preparation and drinking. The rest is used for washing, flushing the toilet, taking a shower, and activities like watering the garden or washing the car. In a city of 1 million people, this means that 130 million liters of tap water are consumed every day. This is only a small percentage of the overall water usage in a city. Most of the water is consumed by industries and used for agriculture. This water consumption is part of the city's surface water cycle. Rainfall, stream flow, evaporation, and wastewater are also part of this cycle. The surface water cycle should be in balance in order to provide a high quality living environment and a healthy city. But the balance of the water system is fragile. For instance, when there is not enough water, the soil will dry out and the city will heat up. More air conditioning power is needed. But if there is not enough water to cool down power plants, the power grid might fail. With heavy rainfall, on the other hand, the city needs to get rid of the abundance of water. If the soil cannot absorb the rainwater, the city has to rely on its sewers. If the sewer system does not have the capacity to transport the water, parts of the city will flood. When this wastewater gets mixed with surface water, it causes pollution and can spread diseases. A good balance of the water system is imperative for both humans and cities and needs to be safeguarded at all times. Brazil, known as a vast country with great expanse of rainforest, the lungs of the world. Many rivers run through the country. Big rivers, like the Amazon, make it the nation with the largest freshwater reserve in the world. Most Brazilian major cities were founded along rivers or deltas. These rivers provided the people with fresh water and made quick and easy transport of goods possible. The sea connected Brazil with the international trading routes, and for many cities, the waterfront became an appealing element which formed their identity. During the second half of the 20th century, cities like Sao Paulo started to prosper. Large industrial companies settled on the Tiete riverfront and brought jobs and wealth. More jobs meant more people came to Sao Paulo, and the city grew. Very fast. The rapid growth of the Brazilian cities had a downside. This growth was often uncontrolled, and the construction of the basic sanitation systems did not follow at the same pace. Today, 5-10% to of people have no direct access to fresh tap water, and an even larger number of households are not connected to the sewer system. There is a serious imbalance in the urban water system in large parts of major Brazilian cities. These parts lack a proper waste regulation. People, as well as industries and agricultural businesses, use the rivers to dump their waste. This pollution limits the possibility to use the water for drinking. And it is this pollution that has become the main cause of many diseases. The majority of hospital visits are directly related to this. Regular floods during the wet season are another example of the imbalance. Deforestation for the purpose of agriculture and the use of impermeable materials on surfaces lead to heavier water flow.
canalized rivers with low output capabilities and the construction of large infrastructure near waterfronts are the cause of these city-wide floods that threaten mobility, habitability, energy distribution, and economic stability. For a lot of Brazilian cities, restoring the water cycle balance is crucial. Just like a human body, or a city, a country requires a good balance in its water system. This is the Netherlands. Roughly one-third of the Dutch territory is actually below sea level. This is where a third of the population lives and most of the economy is concentrated. The Dutch are usually seen as the world's finest controllers of water. But are they? They certainly had a lot of practice living in the Delta area. In the early Middle Ages, channels and ditches were dug in the wet peatlands to drain them from water and make the land suitable for agriculture. As an unintended effect, exposure to air caused the peatland to oxidize and set. The surface level continued to drop until it lay below the water level of the rivers. Eventually, dikes and mills were used to drain the excess water. In the north of the country, people lived on artificial dwelling mounds. They started to link these tarps together, forming a series of dikes. These dikes protected the hinterland against flooding. People saw the benefits of working together and formed cooperatives, resulting in the first water council. These water councils are the oldest form of democratic government in the Netherlands and made a basis for a stable economy. The low laying grounds gave the sea easy access to the land. In the north, the sea had washed away the peatland, creating an internal saltwater lake, the Zouder Zee. With this Zouder Zee, the sea took back a lot of land. But the new sea arm offered a great potential for trade, and new cities arose around it. Dutch cities like Amsterdam grew. A careful relationship with the water stimulated this extensive growth. First, a dam was built, around which the city was formed. Later, canals were dug to the city center to make transportation of goods possible. People, on the other hand, could use the canals for sanitation. This evolved in the following ages to an underground sewer system. These new cities and this new prosperous economy had to be protected against the water. Dikes were built and had to be maintained and raised continuously. At its peak in 1915, the coastline that had to be protected was 2,500 kilometers long. It was an almost impossible task to monitor and maintain this vast coastline protection. A flood disaster in 1916 led to the building of the Offslaut Dyke. This 28 kilometers dike reduced the coastline with more than 600 kilometers. Another reduction in the coastline with 700 kilometers followed some 50 years later after a huge flood in 1953. With these interventions, new opportunities arose such as the reclamation of land. But they also brought unexpected and unwanted changes to the economic and ecological systems. While the coastline was shortened over the centuries, a similar development took place along all Dutch rivers and streams. From the Middle Ages until the end of the 20th century, riverbeds were narrowed and straightened, dikes were constructed, and rivers were canalized. Today, however, due to the changes in climate, rivers have to cope with more water, requiring more and more space. Out of necessity, and mainly by trial and error, the Dutch have gradually learned a lot about handling the water cycle balance. The canals, 
dams, dikes, sewage systems, and harbors are an inevitable element of many Dutch cities, and the water system still defines their structure today. In the northern part of the Dutch Delta, on the border of the Ijsselmeer and the River Ijssel, a small city called Kompen is situated. When a storm pushes up the water of the Ijsselmeer, the River Ijssel can't relieve itself of the water, and the water level of the river will rise drastically. In order to protect Kompen and the surrounding towns, a multi-layer plan was developed. An inflatable storm surge barrier called the Balkstu was built to prevent neighboring towns and larger industrial infrastructure from flooding. In the city, other measures had to be taken. Heightening the K was not an option, so a new barrier was designed. A barrier in building blocks that could be built within a day with the help of volunteers. This means that the K is always open, but when a storm surge is predicted, the barrier is quickly constructed. Unique is the fact that local housing is part of the barrier. Facades have been reinforced and waterproofed in order to be part of the barrier. The measures the city of Dordrecht takes for safety in case of flood are a good example of the strategy called Room for the River. The city is located at a junction of two of the country's main rivers. Every so often, the city has to deal with excess water that is brought in by the river, the Meerwede. To protect the city from this excess water, a series of dikes were built. But the dikes alone could not protect the city from all this extra water. So a plan was made to have less water flow to Dordrecht. Dikes in the nearby area that is not inhabited were rebuilt a bit more inland. So when the river has excess water, it has a wider flood area. Examples like these can be found along all the larger rivers of the Netherlands, giving room for the river while improving safety. Rediscovering the qualities of water and how it can be used to make cities and landscapes more resilient is a challenge that involves many different stakeholders. Working together, and keeping the health and safety for future generations in mind is key in designing our cities for both Brazil and the Netherlands.